All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Twimble AI Podcast. I am your host, Sam Charrington. Today, I'm joined by Cody Coleman. Cody is co-founder and CEO of Coactive AI. We are, of course, coming to you live from the Future Frequency Podcast Studio here at AWS reInvent Conference. Uh, which I've been covering via X and LinkedIn. Be sure to find and follow me there for the latest reInvent and AI updates and insights. Cody, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's it's awesome to be here, Sam. I'm super excited to uh, have this conversation with you, especially since before we started rolling, you talked about how you listened to the podcast when you were doing your PhD. Uh, yeah. And that was Stanford? Yeah, yeah, Stanford University. So I think I started right around the time that the podcast did, back in 20, 2016. That is awesome. Yeah, yeah. That is awesome. Yeah, and it's um, it's just been awesome, you know. Like, I spent my entire career at the intersection of data, systems, and machine learning. So your podcast and uh, the topics that you cover really, really resonate with me. Very, very cool, very cool. So tell us a little bit about your background and uh, what you do your PhD in and what brought you to founding Coactive. Yeah, yeah. So so I spent all of my professional and academic career at the intersection of data systems and machine learning. And back in 2016, when I started my, my PhD, um, I joined the Dawn Project at Stanford, which was about democratizing uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, the thing that I loved about computer science was the fact that, you know, all you needed, like when I was growing up, was a computer and an internet connection to create something that would impact the lives of thousands, millions, or billions of people around the world. Yeah. But with AI, you know, it started to change. There was all these barriers. You needed like a tremendous amount of compute in order to be able to do anything, a tremendous amount of data to do anything. So, um, and a tremendous amount of expertise. So I focused on bringing down those barriers. Like my, my dissertation was resource and data efficient deep learning. Okay. Yeah. And how did you approach that in your dissertation? Yeah, so, so the first part of my dissertation, thinking about the computational resources aspect of it, um, I created the first end-to-end benchmark focused on um, ML system performance, Dawn Bench. Okay. Um, which, uh, uh, you know, really got the industry to focus on training time and training costs and inference costs and inference latency. And then that grew into ML Perf. Mm-hmm. Um, and ML Commons? And ML Commons, yeah. Yep. It was a, it was kind of a wild journey, you know. Second year as a PhD student, I'm like, who's going to, like, pay attention to me <laughs> with, like, releasing Dawn Bench? And then just, like, the, you know, the uh, years following after that to see that grow into ML Perf. And then now ML Commons, this whole nonprofit, really at that mission of democratizing AI to make sure that it benefits everyone. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. And so... Uh, from the PhD to Coactive, what was that path? Yeah, so 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 the first part of my uh, of my PhD focused on the computational resources oh, piece right. of it, yep. and then the second part, you know, was thinking about bringing down the data barrier. So I was thinking about, um, you know, there had to be a, a smarter way than just tossing like every data that you can think of at like a machine learning model. Yep. So I did research into active learning and core set selection. Um, to be smarter about what data points we train on and, th- and that we label. And through that experience, I was able to work at leading tech companies like Pinterest and Meta and seeing how they were actually able to you know, leverage AI to work with all of their content and improve things like search, uh, ads, recommendation, um, you know, protect the safety of online communities, protect copyright material, um, and that there was this kind of emerging playbook that was, that was forming around AI but there was no enterprise, you know, grade solution for doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you needed to have like a bunch of PhDs like me to be able to do anything. Um, and I, I saw that as kind of a, a, you know, an opportunity to build something here and that there was a real need. And that was uh, the genesis for Coactive. Hmm. Now, active learning always struck me as an underutilized technology. Uh, I'm wondering if you share that perspective or if you saw it in use at all those places that you mentioned. Yeah. So you you're definitely preaching to the choir here. And like, you know, I'm, I'm biased in this regard, but um, active learning is such a funny uh, technology because from an academic perspective, it's kind of a neglected area of research when mm-hmm. we think about kind of everything that's happened and kind of modern artificial intelligence and machine learning. Mm-hmm. But when we go into practice, you know, because of the fact that it's so expensive to label data and so costly and slow, you know, all the big tech companies were doing active learning in order to bring down costs and to make things faster mm-hmm. and more accurate. 
And that's only gotten more and more important as we have these kind of models that can get us, you know, general understanding 80% of the way there. And now it's really kind of the key like challenge around, around you know, machine learning is figuring out what are those right data points, those few, those few examples that you need in order to be able to fine tune to your specific use case, mm -hmm. where active learning is more important than ever in practice. Yeah. But from an academic perspective, it's understudied. And so it sounds like you're saying it is used pretty broadly in practice, uh, only at larger companies, or ha has it trickled down to smaller companies? I know last last year, a couple of years ago, maybe we really covered on the podcast the idea that Andrew Ng popularized data-centric AI, yeah. which seemed to kind of tug at some of the same strings, but yeah. with, you know, not necessarily centered on active learning as an approach. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually so funny that you bring that up. Um, we, we actually co-organized the first workshop on data-centric AI at Neurots with oh, okay. Andrew Ng and folks from Meta and Google back then. Um, and, and with that whole kind of movement from model-centric AI to data-centric AI, you know, active learning and core set selection um, are kind of, you know, fundamental technology, a, a, a part of this broader movement to focus yeah. in on data as, as, you know, we've seen models kind of, um, of course, there's always progress, but it's, you know, standardizing in terms of like, you know, transformers taking over the world and this focus on data. So the data-centric AI movement uh, and focusing on things like, you know, uh, data quality, data selection, data cleaning, like weak supervision, all of these things. Yeah. Very much in line with, um, you know, the research that I was doing at Stanford. And I was, you know, excited to be a part of creating that first workshop at Neurops on data centric AI. Mm -hmm. And then also in working with um, ML Commons as they created the data perf benchmark suite, uh, suite for data centric AI. And we even helped shape the, the vision data selection benchmark in the data perf uh, benchmark suite. Now, as much as we're talking about uh, kind of low level infrastructure and platform stuff, and that was the environment that you kind of grew up in career wise, uh, Don, um, Coactive isn't doing, it, it's not a tool play, it's not a platform play, it's more of an application, is that right? Um, uh, uh, what's the right way to think about it? So, so, so Coactive is, as I would describe it, a, a multimodal asset platform okay. or, or map for short that makes it easy to search and analyze content. Mm -hmm. Kind of what I realized very quickly after I left academia and you know started Coactive and started working with enterprises is just realizing that um, there's so much uh, infrastructure systems and processes that need to be like uh, stitched together from like an infrastructure platform perspective to do any of this. Mm -hmm. And that um, for many companies, for many enterprises, it's a huge barrier that they can't, you know, overcome. Taking a step back, when you think about how enterprises, you know, work with image and video data, um, you know, before Coactive and before this recent wave of multimodal learning, you had to do this tag load search process. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to tag the raw images and videos either through human or machine annotations. And then you would load those annotations into your systems. And those annotations are nothing more than like a JSON file with a bunch of words. And you would search based off of those annotations. And you know, um, that's a slow, expensive and inflexible process. Mm -hmm. and, and fundamentally what we're doing at Coactive is we're leveraging AI to flip that on its head with a load search tag approach where we can actually load and index the raw images and videos and make them searchable without any metadata or tags whatsoever. And then- Is this a, an explicit nod to kind of the shift from ETL to ELT? Yeah, 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 <laughs> I know. I, I, so like in thinking about tag load search, TLS, uh, uh -huh. you know, to uh, a load search tag LST world, uh -huh. you know, I think of it very akin to, to the transition from, you know, uh, ETL to ELT. Yeah. You know, where, where effectively you get greater flexibility, greater speed, and it's just a more agile and cost effective way in order to be able to work with with content, mm -hmm. just in the same way that in the data warehousing world, doing uh, ELT can give you greater flexibility and allow you to do transforms after the data has already been loaded. What you're describing in terms of a kind of a multimedia, multimodal asset platform reminds me of, I'm forgetting the name of the individual and the company, but also at Stanford, um, I know you know who I'm talking about because he ran a systems conference out of Stanford for a while and he had a video platform company. 
uh, Matroid, I think. Oh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Re- Reza? Reza, yes. Yes, 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 yes. yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Similar, yeah. Uh, are you going after similar ideas from a product perspective? Yeah, so super great question. You know, fundamentally when I think about it, when we're, we're trying to make it easy to search and analyze content. Yeah. Um, whereas I would say like, there's a lot of people that are, you know, their mission is more make computer vision easy. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a subtle but important difference there, you know, in terms of like the audience and in terms of like the problems that you're solving. Um, there's a massive ML community out there and making like the process of doing computer vision easier, providing that infrastructure um, is great and super valuable and it targets that ML audience. Yeah. But fundamentally with Coactive, we wanted to target kind of the more traditional data audience. You know, mm-hmm. thinking about this like past decade and in, in the big data movement, we've established all these kind of great workflows around ad search and recommendation centered really around structured and semi-structured data, you know, tables and documents. Yeah. And this massive ocean of unstructured visual content has sat kind of outside of that world. And fundamentally, we want to bring structure to the unstructured data so that it can fit into this big data movement and the workflows that people already have today. So as opposed to targeting the tool at a computer vision engineer who's trying to analyze lots of video and wants something to accelerate that work, you're targeting your offering at you know media managers or asset managers at a ad agency or at a, a large brand um, who don't know or care anything about computer vision multimodal models that kind of thing yes exactly exactly okay. yeah our, our platform caters to both technical and non-technical uh, folks within enterprises okay um, because I know for like you and I, like AI has been like, has seemed <laughs> ubiquitous for like, you know, years now. Yeah. But um, for a lot of enterprises out there, you know, outside of like Silicon Valley. It just um, started exactly one year ago on <laughs> November 30th, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, we're still, they were still like doing like data transformation, digital transformation and things like that. Right, right. Uh, and just getting that like, you know, past decade of big data. And, and now having to deal with AI and like try to create kind of new systems while they're still thinking about, you know, just big data processes and things. Um, we wanted to target those folks, again, kind of coming back to that mission of, of democratizing AI. So it's not just like the tech first companies that are able to, that have like a tremendous amount of PhDs and ML engineers that can benefit from this next wave of intelligent applications. That it's all the other organizations as well. And that's even individuals you know, I was going to say like you and I, but we're probably not the, the average person out there, <laughs> but really enabling everyone from like, you know, media and entertainment companies that have to get content out of the door faster to monetize it on streaming or social media. Mm-hmm. We have editorial teams, you have marketing teams, you have production teams where their success depends on their ability to be able to search, filter and analyze content mm-hmm. or in consumer retail. When you think about the rise of e-commerce, we're making purchasing decisions based off of images and videos. And the systems haven't really adapted. You know, kind of one anecdote that I love here is that um, there's a a large fashion company and they did this massive marketing campaign around what, you know, you and I would probably call ripped jeans. Mm -hmm. And, (laughs) you know, the marketing campaign was successful. You know, it drove a lot of traffic to their website, a lot of um, uh, searches. But the problem was that when when users search for ripped jeans, nothing came up. It, it, mm-hmm. it, and, and the problem was that when they looked into the data, when they looked into the SKUs and the products um, that had ripped jeans, they were labeled as distressed jeans mm-hmm. or tagged as distressed jeans. Right. And that disconnect, you know, as soon as they fixed that and they changed from distressed jeans to ripped jeans, uh, those products sold out like that. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Yeah, one thing that I've been saying for many years now is that search sucks. It's just hard. And I've been kind of revisiting this in the context of RAG, like everyone is talking about, hey, let's just throw a vector database in front of uh, an LLM, and now we're going to get all these wonderful responses. And there's still a lot of hard work that has to go into optimizing that retrieval and search folks have been trying to get that working for many many years it's not easy yeah um and 
that uh, what the example you described kind of reminds me of just the difficulty of getting search type of search type experiences correct. And now these dialogue experiences are actually search experiences under the covers, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's kind of, it's funny, like search, um, you know, seemed kind of stable for like the past like two decades in a sense. And it's such an exciting time now when we think about these foundation models and everything that's happening and information retrieval as a result of that. We're now like everything that we know about search is kind of like, you know, uh, uh, it's really a paradigm shift in how we think about searching, you know, all forms of content. Um, Meaning from kind of a keyword oriented paradigm to more of an embedding or vector oriented, vector search oriented paradigm. Exactly, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. You know, exactly. Where it's like rather than this kind of like having to, you know, have discrete like labels, being able to actually, you know, effectively calculate the DNA of content. You know, mm -hmm. with a vector, a vector is just like, um, a vector embedding is just a, a list of a few hundred or thousand floating point numbers, but it captures all the semantic information that's captured in an image, a video, or an audio file. And the same way that, you know, you can pull like a, a hair off of your head and you can get like a, a strand of DNA that captures everything that describes your genetic makeup and who you are. And um, it, we're having this like DNA moment, you know, I remember when like DNA was like first sequenced and it was like a huge thing um, and everything that fall, it fell out of it. And it's such a fundamental kind of paradigm shift, you know, just in the way that like editing DNA to create something new like CRISPR, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, like is a massive thing. That's kind of what's happening in generative AI when you think about being able to actually uh, uh, like edit and use these embeddings to generate something new, like in a, a rag type of setup. Mm -hmm. And then the same way, you can also use uh, embeddings to diagnose problems just in the same way that you, know, you look at something like 23andMe and you can use DNA to diagnose diseases. And mm -hmm. you can do it for information retrieval to search a massive database of content, um, which is incredible. Let's go a little bit deeper into uh, Coactive and kind of the technical underpinnings that enable you to do what you do. I'm imagining that embeddings and uh, is a part of that. We heard in the keynote this morning and Swami's keynote here at reInvent, uh, he actually spent a bit of time talking about the complexity of uh, embeddings and in particular multimodal embeddings. Is that, that's part of what you're tackling? Yeah, it's a, it's a part of it, yeah. And when you think about it, um, there's a whole, it kind of goes back to this old paper about the hidden technical debt of like ML, you know, where it's like the embedding in the model is like, you know, kind of one, it's a very important but, uh, piece, but it's only one piece of the overall system. Yeah. And when I think about what we built at Coactive, um, it's effectively like we've built a car, we've built out kind of all of the systems, all of the infrastructure, and then we can swap out, we take a model agnostic approach where we can swap out different encoders, different like embedding models as easily as it would be to swap out tires on a car. So, because ultimately, you know, the thing that I think we've seen in this past year is that AI is moving so rapidly and it's unclear what's going to happen in the next, you know, 12, 18 months as far as what model is going to be best or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But companies, enterprises have to build today. Mm -hmm. So by, be crea by creating this, this platform, this multimodal asset platform, uh, people can build today but future-proof themselves as we just continue to see rapid progress in the, in the modeling piece of it. Um, and one other thing that I wanted to touch on, it's, it's, it's actually quite interesting because you mentioned this around search where, you know, the way that I think about it is that we have like, there's a bunch of like, there's like AI people that are trying to reinvent and like rediscover everything that we've like learned in data <laughs> systems and databases, you know? Like, information retrieval. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Information retrieval, you know, scalability. Distributed computing. Distributed yeah. computing, data providence, <laughs> data rights, data privacy, data governance, all these things. That Not are to like, mention the humanities and ethics. And <laughs> exactly, exactly. So you have this like one side from like the, the AI side kind of rediscovering everything in databases. Yeah. And then there's also this like, you know, same thing from the Swami's keynote, you have all the databases kind of piece of it, um, actually trying mm -hmm. to integrate the AI approach as well. Yeah, yeah. And fundamentally with Coactive, what we're doing is we're taking an AI first approach to data systems where the two things are really married together rather than from like from the very beginning, rather than kind of like AI over here and databases over there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, what I, what I would love to get at kind of in prompting you to, to go a little bit deeper is like you've built this 
system that that kind of targets a, a non necessarily technical end user or, or both that uses you know it's kind of cutting edge in the sense of like we're trying to figure out multimodal ai and you're doing yeah. multimodal ai what are the lessons that you've learned or the techniques that you've stumbled across or the cool things that you figured out that other folks that are building kind of in the space you know multimodal or, or similar um you know, using similar types of technologies what are the the things that you've learned that others can benefit from understanding systems is, is super important i mean every kind of breakthrough in ai has kind of been around systems and and um you know, maybe taking a step back to kind of put it into perspective. Um, when we think about the past decade and the big data movement, it's focused primarily on structured uh, data and tables. Mm -hmm. And if you think about 10 million rows of tabular data, um, you know, that's about 40 megabytes. If you think about 10 million documents, now you're talking like 10 million pages from Wikipedia, now you're talking about 40 gigabytes. Mm -hmm. That's three orders of magnitude different. Mm -hmm. That's like going from the surface area of Lake Tahoe to the surface area of the Caspian Sea. When you think about 10 million images, let alone like video, um, 10 million images is about 20 terabytes if you look at the open images data set. That's yeah. another three orders of magnitude difference and that's like the surface area of the Pacific Ocean. So when we think about kind of the tools that we've built today for, you know, the big data movement, um, they're great for working at, you know, the scale of like a data lake. You know, it's kind of like having like a rowboat or a canoe, like a, you'll, it'll be fine to get across a lake. But mm -hmm. if you told me to cross the Pacific Ocean with, uh, you know, a rowboat, I would think that you're crazy <laughs> and that fundamentally you need a bigger boat. And that's, you know, kind of core to how we think about what we built at Coactive. And then with that high level context that kind of out of the way, you know, I can go through kind of, um, you know, the piece by piece things. So mm -hmm. first off, when you think about where does data sit, you know, where do images and videos sit? And it's in S3 as a bunch of individual files and like a network file system on, on uh, like in S3. Mm -hmm. So first, like, um, you know, just from like a, you know, assistance perspective, rather than trying to read a bunch of small files from a network like system, coalescing that together into some form of bi like a binary format, whether it be, you know, Parquet, LMDB, things like that, will give you a dramatic, a dramatic kind of improvement in performance in your downstream systems to make things uh, way faster. Um, and then from there, you can do, you can embed like very quickly, and then you can also re-embed um, as new models come out and there's new improvements and try things out way more quickly because you have all the files coalesced together in a single thing. So, mm -hmm. so thinking about you know data locality, which is you know kind of a, a core piece of systems, is really really huge at that very beginning piece. And then um, you know something that Swami mentioned. Uh, uh, earlier today as well is like all of your data kind of coming together. When you think about like an images, like images, you have like an object store, you have, you know, a, 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 a relational database that has information and metadata about it. Then you have this vector database um, as well. When we think about actually managing the embeddings to actually make them searchable and to be able to do other things on top of it. Mm -hmm. So thinking about kind of um, how do you keep things consistent, you know, across kind of all these different um, uh, 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 forms of like effectively the same asset yeah. is a, a tough challenge, but something that I think is really important in order to be able to provide kind of the interface that people have known around databases and working with data. But then once you do that, once you do that heavy lifting, which is like, you know, kind of like the part of the core systems piece at, at Coactive, it, it then gives you this unifying layer at the embedding uh, uh, kind of stage where you can do all sorts of things on top of it. So, you know, we can do search, like intelligent search is kind of our first capability. But then we have, you know, dynamic tagging where we can actually leverage active learning and leverage data-centric AI techniques to make a very quick and, you know, almost like uh, going from a waterfall approach for ML development to an agile approach to ML development, where interactively you can define and fine tune your models and define classifiers for domain specific concepts, and then generate consistent metadata over your entire catalog of content. What's an example of, uh, of, of that? Can you kind of make that more concrete? Yeah. So um, I'll talk about fandom here. Um, so fandom is the world's largest fan-generated entertainment and gaming platform. Mm -hmm. They are, you know, they, they've been a champion and the end-to-end -end resource for 350 million fans worldwide. Mm -hmm. And, you know, their users 
every year upload tens of millions of images to their platform. And by and large, a lot of that, a lot of that, you know, data is really good and really valuable. But there's there's a small fraction of it that is violates their community guidelines and corrupts the safety of the communities, the fandoms that they've created. Okay. Um, and what they had to do previously in order to be able to kind of like, you know, their, their community guidelines and codifying their community guidelines or to enforce their community guidelines, they used to have to have human beings review every single image that was uploaded to the fandom platform. You know, mm -hmm. kind of going back to this tag load search mentality. Yeah. You know, you had to tag the raw images and videos um, in order to be able to do anything with it. So they were very much in that tag load search world. And this is super problematic for a lot of like reasons. You know, one, um, it's it's expensive actually having human beings review tens of millions of images every single year. Mm -hmm. It's also slow. You had to wait like you know 24 hours in terms of an SLA for a human being to go through that review process. And even thinking about ethics, you know, there's like there's just some content out there in the world that yeah, like someone's got to look at it. Yeah, or you know, like, a, or that really should never see the light of day. Right, you know, it's like right. unfortunate that these people have to like, you know, look at like, you know, the the darkest parts of the internet. Mm -hmm. And with Coactive and working with with fandom and doing dynamic tacking, you know, we were able to actually codify, enable their community, um, uh, you know, their, their community team, who's a non technical team, to take their community guidelines, take like, you know, the process that they have been doing codify that into these dynamic tags and then generate metadata over every asset that they had in the past as well as all the new assets that are coming in. And what we were able to do is reduce their like, you know, uh, uh, manual labeling efforts by 85%. And we also saw that you know, we originally, you know, we like to, to over deliver. We were like, hey, it's going to take you six months to be able to recoup yeah. the value of this. They saw the kind of performance and cost savings results that uh, we had projected or predicted for six months in two months. OK, so way faster in, in, in dramatically reducing the amount of data that they actually have to go through and, and manually annotate by generating that consistent metadata um, over all of their content. And that's kind of just like, you know, um, just a day one problem. You know, mm -hmm. the, the real powerful thing, they had been looking, actively searching for solutions, like AI powered solutions to do mm -hmm. this, but no existing solutions would solve their problem because of the fact that they were kind of one size fits all. You know, they didn't, uh, they weren't able to be customized to that last mile for different fandoms. Like you, you might have a different set of community guidelines for the fandom around Game of, Thro uh, Game of Thrones than, mm -hmm. you know, Puppy Patrol. Yeah. And being able to actually kind of, you know, codify that and understand and specifically for their use case um, was huge for them and being able to actually you know take the the uh, save people from having to look at like the worst content that's out there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. now the process that you described calls to mind uh, ideas or techniques like weak supervision programmatic labeling or some of those um, are those actual techniques that you're using as part of uh, delivering the, the solution? Yeah, so, so weak supervision in a sense, since weak supervision or, or semi-supervised learning is like a very broad yeah, you know, category of, of techniques. <laughs> so so in, 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 the, in that regard, we do stuff in like weak supervision and semi-supervision. The programmatic labeling kind of piece of it is, uh, is a little bit more difficult because when you think about um, you know, labeling functions and, and things like that. Um, Applying those to images and media is like the classic define a cat in this picture problem, it, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, like text is like almost like a, you know, a discrete problem. You know, you have this whole vocabulary, you have these right. like tokens of words and things like that. So you can like a human being can be like, you know, if this name, uh, like if blank is married to blank, you know, you can write like a labeling function and a rule to be able to kind of, you know, uh, predict that based off of text. But, yeah. you know, I'm not an artist. And if you ask me to describe <laughs> a bunch of labeling functions for like a cat or yeah. like, uh, you know, I don't know, a bag of chips or something like that, like, like it would be impossible for me to right. do. Right. So, so fundamentally, that's where being able to do stuff like active learning as kind of a starting point where you can point to actual visual examples. Um, really helps to be able to actually kind of quickly get that signal and then focus in on that signal to be able to kind of um, very accurately, very quickly provide uh, predictions. Because um, 
you know, text is again kind of like a discrete problem, and then visual content is more like a continuous problem. You know, going mm -hmm. back to like my signal processing days, where you're, you're looking at like the level of like raw pixel values, and you know, if, yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting, interesting. So then, that kind of reinforces the need to have a very solid foundation of embeddings and uh, things like that. It sounds like you're relying heavily on that for providing this functionality, like, you know, identifying neighbors of some image that was identified uh, and using that as a way to do the labeling. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, to, to dive in there about, like, how do, how do embeddings fit into, yeah. you know, active learning, right? Because it's interesting, like, the active learning literature, you know, was kind of, you know, started before this big data movement. So it focused on, you know, data sets of, like, a smaller scale, like a few tens of thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands was like large scale active learning mm -hmm. in the literature. Um, and you could do things that were, you know, quadratic and you could search over the entirety, like all of the examples. But um, when you think about kind of this big data movement where we have millions, billions of data points, um, it's impossible for you to go to all the raw assets for each individual loop of active learning in order to do it it's just not performant and scalable enough for this big data era. So, mm -hmm. so that was actually part of the research that I did during my PhD. I was working at Meta uh, and published this paper, Similarity Search for Efficient Active Learning and Search of Rare Concepts. And the core idea there was the, the fact that we could, uh, you know, these large language models, these foundation models, um, you know, if you think of the GPT-2 paper, it was called Large Language Models Are Few-Shot Learners. Mm -hmm. and, and the key kind of innovation there is that we have these kind of generic representations that actually can, you know, cluster unseen concepts uh, pretty well, like, together in this latent yeah. space. So then rather than doing this global search over all of, like, your unlabeled data to find the most informative data points, you can instead, uh, in the embedding space, start locally and expand based off of that. And what that does is it goes from like, you know, I remember doing experiments where it took like, you know, more than a day to do a single round of active learning over like 10 billion images to something that could be done interactively in like a Jupyter notebook mm -hmm. on like my, my uh, dev machine. Meaning because you're not, no longer working with these large assets, you're working with uh, and much more dense representations of those assets. Exactly, exactly. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, and it's kind of funny. I, I love the dense representations. It takes me back, it takes, it goes back to like, you know, word to vec, you know? It's like, <laughs> like, like when embeddings <laughs> like first happen, you know, like the right. history of embeddings. I know that like vectors and everything like that are really popular now, but I mean, it's been interesting to see this kind of whole evolution over like the past decade around, around embeddings and dense rep uh, representations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, are you specifically doing multimodal embeddings as part of your approach? Yeah, yeah. We're specifically using multimodal embeddings. Um, so, you know, and, and multimodal is a little bit of a, you know, kind of a suitcase word in, in kind of my mind. <laughs> because, I mean, the way that I think about, like, multimodal is it's about kind of the, the modalities of the inputs to the, the modalities of the outputs, you know, mm -hmm. like, like stability AI is kind of multimodal in the sense that you start with, uh, or stable diffusion is like multimodal in the sense that you start with like one modality, yeah. text, and then you generate like the output is a different modality. It's 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 uh, visual. Mm -hmm. So that's like one type of multimodal in a sense. But then you also have kind of like like uh, what you see in kind of maybe more of um, the large language model kind of multimodal space where they'll have you know image and like text as inputs, but mm -hmm. then the output is just uh, uh, text. Mm -hmm. So that's multimodal as well. And fundamentally, when we think about the multimodal embeddings that we use at Collective, your uh, input might be like a text prompt or text and image, but then the output is going to be images, finding the relevant Im images that match that query, or being able to say, you know, is this image kind of uh, associated with this general class or things like that based off of the embedding. So, um, we use multimodal embeddings in the sense of, you know, going from, you know, image and uh, or text and images or just text by itself to images. Uh, we've talked about kind of the, the system platform. We've talked a little bit about kind of the embedding aspect and how you're using that to enable kind of this automated labeling uh, capability. Um, 
what other interesting, you know, bits or learnings are there that folks can take away from, you know, what you've built in the approach? Thinking about kind of, so Coacto is two and a half years old and, and mm-hmm. um, just thinking about kind of as we engage, or, you know, as we have engage with enterprises and more and more customers and things like that, why people choose Coactive kind of comes down to like five core things. And I think these are lessons that, you know, any practitioner, or any founder or researcher can, 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 can uh, learn from. And you know, first is simplicity, you know, going from this waterfall approach of ML development to a much more agile approach of ML development. Because when you look at like, prior to like embedding based things and things like RAG where you can actually iterate very quickly, it was very much like a waterfall thing. You had to have like a data engineer, get your data into a good place. Mm -hmm. Then an ML researcher would come in and figure out what model you would train. Then you would have to label data so there'd be an annotation team. Then it would go back to the ML researcher to train the model, then ML ops. And then, you know, finally, after all that, it gets to like business intelligence. Um, But with this you know, what we're saying with embedding based things is that there's kind of this great decoupling that's happening from like, you know, the slow, expensive part of deep learning and AI. All Maybe of the diff- someone else is doing that. The models are pre-trained. You don't have to think about it. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And then instead, you can like decouple that from all the different downstream tasks that you like as a business, as an enterprise care about. Mm-hmm. And that's, um, you know, I think of it like in a, from a systems perspective as it's almost like an embedding is a a cache for computation. You know, you're basically, Mm -hmm. rather than having to pass through all those layers, all the hidden layers in like a deep neural network uh, over and over again, every time you process an individual kind of asset or piece of content. Interesting, yeah. You just have the the embedding vector, you know, and that cache is that that, that computation. So unless you're trying to change the relationship between the entities themselves, you can just leave that alone and have that be a proxy for those assets. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. And and that enables this kind of much faster kind of loop and process, you know? Mm-hmm. And then the second kind of piece of it is just scale, you know, kind of going back to like, you know, 10 million, like, like we, we have to move from data lakes to data oceans mm-hmm. um, and to really be able to unlock, you know, all of the data that we have in the world. Like, goes back to this old idea, like Bill Gates said that content is king, you know, and, it, and he predicted in, in 1996 that the real money on the internet was going to be made in content, mm-hmm. just as it was during the broadcasting era, and that, you know, the real long-term winners were going to be the people that were able to effectively leverage their content to deliver information and entertainment. And when you fast forward to today, those those predictions have come true and the king is here. 80% of internet data today, or 80% of internet traffic today is video data. Mm-hmm. And it's predicted that by 2025, 80% of data worldwide is gonna be unstructured data, so it's just audio and video files. Yeah. Um, and that prediction was made before this recent wave of generative AI, which has dramatically <laughs> lowered the barrier. So, you know, it's like, if it was a tidal wave before, it's a tsunami now. And it's just a massive amount of content at mm-hmm. like a different scale than, you know, what we've seen before, you know, 80% of data out there. You know, when we think about the systems that we have, like it's really just like the tip of the iceberg in order to process that. So being able to scale with this like massive ocean of data and move from a data lake to a data ocean is huge. Yeah. And then security, you know, like enterprises, I think as we've all seen kind of over the past year, like data rights and security, data governance is a huge thing. And and ensuring that your data stays your data is, uh, uh, you know, almost like table stakes for a lot of enterprises. And then um, there's the model agnostic piece that I mentioned as well, which is, mm-hmm. which is, you know, over this past year, every single company, every single enterprise that's out there has a mandate to like, it's like an existential, uh, like AI is an existential threat to their business. Like if they don't mm-hmm. use AI, if they don't build things today, they might be left behind. But at the same time, AI is in its inf- uh, infancy. You know, we're evolving very quickly. <laughs> exactly. Very, very quickly. You know, it's like one week company A is like, you know, leading and then and they're like, they have the best model. And then company B comes up and then like, it's like, oh, you know, actually open source is like out there and like, you know, just like uh, amazing. And then another and it's just like and company I, A becomes a soap opera for 10 days. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, it leads to a, a lot of interesting discussions and things like that. You know, it definitely keeps you uh, entertained over the holidays. Holidays, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but like fundamentally, since we're like in the infancy of like this AI era, you know, we're in like when you think about the big data movement, we're like ten years into the big data movement. You know, this is going to be another ten-year journey or more, and we're mm-hmm. at year one right now. 
Right. And it's going to evolve so much. It's like, I mean, you see that today here at like, like AWS reInvent, just the sheer number of foundation models that are coming out, the constant improvements there, um, and being agnostic so you can build today and future-proof yourself for tomorrow is huge. Mm -hmm. I think you're at four. Oh, four, yeah. Um, <laughs> the other thing is um, uh, is being, you know, like cloud agnostic, being able to actually read data from wherever it is, you know, okay. um, because data is everywhere. You know, there's a lot of dark data out there, especially when we think about unstructured data that like mm -hmm. is just sitting all over the place and being able to bring that into like one place um, and unify it across all these different data sources is really, really uh, critical to actually being able to have, uh, to make sense of all of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those those four those five reasons, you know, simplicity, uh, speed and scalability, uh, security, uh, model agnostic and cloud agnostic are are kind of the core kind of lessons and the core reasons why companies choose Coactive today. Mm -hmm. And something that um, any practitioner or startup or enterprise, and no matter what you're building, yeah, to keep in mind is like is huge. Awesome, awesome. Well, Cody, thanks so much for taking some time out of your busy reInvent uh, schedule yeah. and saving some of your voice for us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's been great to chat. Do you have something to throw in? Oh, oh yeah, what, what, one thing that I did want to add is, you know, we're, we're, <laughs> since we're, like, we're at reInvent, I just also want to say like, um, you know, it's been interesting. We, we're two and a half years old as a, uh, as a company and we're like, you know, small. We're like 20, 25 people now okay. as like a company. Um, and AWS has been like an amazing partner I remember when it was just like my co-founder Will and I, and we started the company and we're like, oh my gosh, we're like two guys and like an idea, like how are we gonna do it all? And like, you know, kind of jumping out into the wilderness and, and like the fear of being alone, but with AWS, we've never been alone. Like, I remember um, it was like 2 a.m. and uh, we were doing like a large ingestion job and we were like reaching like our quota limits and things like that and getting alerts. And it was like 2 a.m. and we, uh, you know, texted our account team and being like, hey, can we get a quota in increase at 2 a.m. so that we can actually meet this like deadline that we had for, for a customer. And you know, they were there, you know, they like flipped the switch and we were able to keep going and like awesome. ingest all the data, uh, which has been amazing. And then thinking about as we try to, you know, think about security and those building blocks there. We went through the SOC 2 um, process and everyone told us that it was gonna take us six months to do SOC 2, mm -hmm. but we were able to finish it in, uh, in three months because of the fact that the core building blocks around security and keeping data uh, secure were already available through, uh, through AWS. Mm -hmm. And then even now, you know, in terms of like, as we like go to market and uh, just AWS has been there to support us kind of at every step of the way. And it's um, it's been an awesome, awesome partnership to have them in our corner. Awesome. So shout out to AWS. Shout out to AWS, <laughs> yes. Awesome, well, once again, thanks so much, Cody. Awesome, thanks. Thanks, Sam. Thank thanks you. for having me.